So everybody, it's really an honor and it's a pleasure to interview the, introduce David Hurst to you. So I am reading the biography, but I'm going to add some to it as well. I'll read the words there. So David is a scholar in the Department of Sociology at Goldsmiths College. That was the same department. That was my first job after I finished here. I went to Goldsmiths College in Sociology. He did a master's in philosophy and social theory at Warwick University, and he wrote his doctorate degree uh, there on crimes against humanity and international law. He's the holder of the Sociological Review Fellowship, which enabled him to write uh, Law Against Genocide Cosmopolitan Trials, published in 2003. This book was awarded the British Sociolog uh, Sociological Association Philip Abrams Prize for the best book, the best first book in sociology in 2004, by focusing on two criminal trials uh, from the International Criminal Tribunal, Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia, uh, the trial of Andrei Solonek, the crimes committed during the Holocaust, and David Irving's libel case. The book comes out. Uh, comes, sorry, the book comes to some tentative conclusions with the possibility of the emergence of cosmopolitan law. Uh, David received many awards, including the Rothschild Hanavi Foundation Research Grant uh, for a project to investigate the character and dynamics of anti-Zionism as a contemporary movement and its relationship to anti-Semitism. The research paper output made poss possible by, by this funding was the major working paper published by ISGAP's funded Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism. David was one of our first uh, scholars and researchers with us. The book is entitled Anti-Zionism, Antisemitism, Cosmopolitan Reflections. Um, and David was a research fellow with us at Yale. And it's really, you know, there's some of us old warriors here. We've become old warriors. But David has been fighting issues of contemporary anti-Semitism for many years uh, on the battlefield of ideas. And he's really been at the forefront of kind of the intellectual uh, response to investigate, to assess at the highest levels of scholarship contemporary anti-Semitism and to develop strategies to deal with it. And David really identified what he's going to speak about now as, as sort of what we all know. It's been in the news for uh, the last uh, month or so with Corbin and Livingston and all these characters uh, emerging from under their rocks. Uh, David has been sort of looking at the social, theoretical, political context in which these people have been operating for decades. So David's really an expert on the British context, and being that we're here in the United Kingdom, David is the, the strong voice to assess what's going on. So David, thank you for coming here. David actually flew in from the day from, from Switzerland just to be here, so thank you for going to the trouble to come. <clears throat> Thank you, Charles. I'm going to turn it off, and I think that's better. Um, I just want to say, so, it's Friday afternoon, you have a whole week, be awake, talk to me, talk to each other, talk briefly but often, <laughs> and interrupt me, ask me questions. I've got about, I don't know, 12 hours of slides, I didn't know which slides to bring, or whatever, so I've got much too much. So whatever we want to talk about, whatever we want to think about, we can do that. Um, in fact, find me. Find me on Facebook, find me on Twitter, Google me. There's loads of material, written material, which is actually all much better and much more accurate than you're going to hear today. Today my head is all over the place. I have a book deadline, which is going to be my book on contemporary anti-Semitism. Uh, at the end of September, and everything is swelling around in my head, and I'm structuring it, and I'm trying to bring it together. So I'm not going to give you a polished lecture, or a talk, or anything like that. I'm going to think with you, and I'm going to think things through with you, and that's probably another way of saying that I'm ill-prepared. But let's see <laughs> how we do. Um, the first thing I'm thinking about is the idea of mainstreaming. <coughs> When I was a student in the 80s, um, left anti-Semitism was around. It was around on the kind of weird and dusty corners of the left, actually places where I used to like to hang out. And the kind of Stalinist and Trotskyist and Maoist sort of spaces 
were places where absolutist hostility to Israel were, were kind of rife and where we already begin, began to rehearse these, these arguments. In the 80s, there were battles in Britain over the <coughs> banning of Jewish societies in universities. So very straightforwardly, people said, Zionism is racism, racism is against our student union policy, therefore we can't have Zionist societies in, uh, in our student unions. So this back to the 80s, and we were having these fights. The interesting thing that's happened over the last 20 years, the last 10 years, the last one year, is that the process of mainstreaming, which I was beginning to sniff 10 years ago, I think has really clearly taken hold in a way which is um, really quite clear. Um, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, there was uh, the beginnings of the boycott debate, the debate about whether to boycott Israeli academics within my trade union, the University and College Union. And I remember it very well. I was just telling Ira, actually, um, you know, we were quite excited about this. It, we'd all grown up a bit. We'd all gone off and got PhDs and had kids and were just ready to come back and do something a bit political, really. And this boycott stuff came up. And I remember thinking, this is going to be fun. We're going to make our arguments. Our arguments are strong. We're going to show why boycotting Israel isn't smart and why it's dangerous and why there's all sorts of other things that one could do if one was interested in Israeli and Palestinian peace and siding with the Palestinians and all the rest of it. I thought, this is going to be fun. And Charles phoned me up out of nowhere. I've never heard of him. And he said, oh, you're so courageous. And I just thought, who's this idiot? There's nothing courageous about this. It's really straightforward. We're going to make some arguments. We're going to win. We're going to look good. But Charles was kind of right, really. Well, not that we were courageous, but that it was a real, you know, a kind of career-defining or life-defining move. And I had really no conception of that at the time. So the fight began for us. Well, you know, you can begin it whenever you like, with Dreyfus or, or with the, the Communist Party in the Soviet Union or with, <clears throat> um, as I say, with uh, the Jewish societies in the 80s. But then again, 2003, 2004, 2005, the boycott debate began at UCU. I suspect some of you Americans are much more familiar today with the boycott debate than you would have been two or three years ago. Is that right? Because it's coming, it's coming, it's come to the United States. So we were involved in that fight within the University and College Union, but still we thought the UCU is a kind of weird corner of the left. It's a place which is dominated by, I don't know, three, four hundred activists. The people in each branch who run the branch, who get as a reward, they get to go to Congress and they get to vote for the Cuban Solidarity Campaign. And what became really exciting for them was to boycott Israel and to show their courage about standing up against the Zionist lobby and all of that stuff. And we were worried about this, and we said at the time, there's a mainstreaming, a process of mainstreaming going on. What we've seen in the last two years, the last year in Britain, I think, has been just a real acceleration of that mainstreaming. So, we now have the leader of the Labour Party, who supports the boycott, and who, I'll show you various things that he does. We have a president of the National Union of Students, which is, I think one of the largest youth organisations on the planet, actually. <laughs> Something like 1.4 million young people. The president of the National Union of Students um, says that we have to reject the rhetoric of the peace process in favour of supporting Palestinian resistance. So it's a critique of the two-state solution and of the peace process from the point of view of somebody who wants to subordinate that kind of political struggle for peace to a cheerleading position for the Palestinian movements of which we know. So, President of NUS, leader of the Labour Party, Unite Trade Union, the biggest trade union in Britain. Um, I will give you a quote from their leader, Len McCluskey, who said the other day that the people who are raising the issue of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party are doing so <clears throat> simply to smear 
the left and to smear Jeremy Corbyn. Let me just give you a little video. I don't know how much you've done or how much you know about all this stuff. If you want me to <clears throat> slow down or to speed up, then I will. This is Jeremy Corbyn years ago. I don't know when, about five years ago, four years ago, when he was nothing. He was a Labour MP. He had a kind of particular position on the left of the party and he'd never had any kind of responsibility in the party and he never wanted it. Let me just play you this and listen to, to the, in fact, I will also, as I'm playing you this, I will put up a transcript of what he's saying, if I can move. I want to first of all say thank you everyone for being here tonight and say that tomorrow evening it will be my pleasure and my honour to host an event in Parliament where our friends from Hezbollah will be speaking. I also invited um, friends from Hamas to come and speak as well. Unfortunately, the Israelis would not allow them to travel here, so it's going to be only friends from Hezbollah. So far as I'm concerned, that is absolutely the right function of using parliamentary facilities to invite people to other parts of the world. so that we can promote that peace, that understanding, and that dialogue. And the idea that an organization that is dedicated towards the good of the Palestinian people and bringing about long-term peace and social justice and political justice in the whole region should be labeled as a terrorist organization by the British government is really a big, big historical mistake. And I would invite the government to reconsider its position on this matter and start talking directly to Hamas and Hezbollah. That is the only way. So, it's an interesting piece because what everybody got from that was that he called Hamas and Hezbollah friends. He referred to them as friends. Now, he kind of wriggled. He said, I'm interested in peace. I'm interested in a peace process. I'm interested in a process which would involve bringing people at like Hamas and Hezbollah into the process and talking with them. Now, on one level, you know, kind of fair enough. There are certainly people within those organisations who may be at some point interested in talking peace. <clears throat> the problem is that people didn't watch the video because what he also says in the video, as you've just seen, is he talks about Hamas and Hezbollah as organisations that are dedicated towards the good of the Palestinian people and bringing about long-term peace and social justice and political justice in the whole region. So on the one hand he says this was nothing, this was just diplomatic language. I was just, you know, we're for peace, we're for talking, talking is good. When you talk to somebody, you refer to them in a friendly way. As I say, on one level, fair enough. But actually, he also has political support for Hamas and Hezbollah. And you can't get much more supportive than describing them as organisations dedicated to the good of the Palestinian people and bringing about long-term peace and social justice. It's kind of astonishing. It's also astonishing that nobody picked up on it. There was lots of stuff about the Friends comment. Not so much about the organisation dedicated to peace and social justice. And he never discussed that. He never said, no, no, I was wrong about that. They're not dedicated to peace and social justice. Just skipped over it. So firstly, there's a kind of studied ambivalence. On the one hand, he says, I'm just for peace. On the other hand, he's made a whole number of visits to Gaza, he's been hosted by Hamas, and he's made this kind of intervention, which is very clear about political support for that kind of politics. Now, one of the things I want to say is, <clears throat> excuse me, already I'm making him sound a bit mad, aren't I? Already, he sounds like just some crazy sort of anti-Semitic loon. And I want people to try really hard and to be really careful to put themselves into a slightly different way of thinking. Right? At the moment in Britain you have to put yourself into a way of thinking where this guy is really important and really exciting and is leading a movement against the, you know, the establishment, against the right, against the Blairites, against the people who were responsible for the war in Iraq, and all of that stuff. I want you to put yourself back into that head. You will certainly have to do that when you come to teach about contemporary anti-Semitism. Um, 
And it's hard, and I, I'm sure, and I know that some of what we're doing this in these two weeks is preparing ourselves to do that. And one of the ways I think we have to prepare ourselves to do that is to remember the excitement of radical politics. One of the things that's often said is that people can't recognise anti-Semitism if it doesn't come with a Nazi uniform and a swastika and jackboots. And I think that's slightly wrong, because I think Nazism, even Nazism, didn't come with a swastika and jackboots originally. I think Nazism was exciting, and it was radical. And it was a radical critique of a system that everybody thought was, was um, corrupt and hypocritical. So even Nazism, I think we have to rethink. And to understand Nazism, we have to understand why intellectuals and activists and philosophers were attracted to it, were excited by it. Similarly, the stuff that Harris Rafik was talking about earlier on, we need to understand why people are attracted by Islamist movements. And we need to understand why people are attracted to this kind of speech, which is not only for a dialogue with Hezbollah, but also actually believes that Hezbollah is part of the global network of movements which are fighting against the real bad guys. Because that's how this works. There's a splitting. So at one time, socialism was a kind of positive project. It was a project about rebuilding the world, about taking down what was bad for people and rebuilding a world that was better for people. It was a positive political project. Whether you like it or not, whether you think it was mad or not, whatever, it was a positive political project. What we have now more and more is a is, is not a movement which supports the kind of self-organisation of the oppressed, the workers, the women, lesbian and gay people, in each country against their own oppressors. Because more and more what we have now is a politics that splits the world along kind of national and ethnic lines. And it redefines the oppressed, not as people who are themselves oppressed, but as people who are in a particular fixed geographical or social location. So there's quite a big slippage. I can talk more about that shortly. Enough to say that this form of politics, this way of understanding the world, is one in which Bush and Blair and the United States and Israel are the real bad guys. And you, you're all clever, right? You can all construct the argument. I might, you know, if we had more time, I'd make you sit in groups and construct the argument about why Bush and Blair and Israel are the real bad guys, how they rationalise and industrialise killing and oppression and all the rest of it, blah, 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 blah. And within that framework, what we're interested in is building the coalition of the people who are against that. And as Judith Butler said, people know Judith Butler? In my department where I teach, Judith Butler is God. Judith Butler is, you know, one of the most respected social theorists on the planet. And Judith Butler says, we have to remember that Hezbollah are part of the global left. What does that mean? That means that Hezbollah are part of the global network which is taking on the real bad guys. And the real bad guys are the ones with power. The American state, the European states, Israel. In fact, to describe it differently, the democratic states. Or to go back into that framework, the states which claim to be democratic. Because one of the key things is about democracy, about which I'll come to later too. But just to say that in a world where we're faced with anti-Semitism, we're faced with jihadism, we're faced with people like Donald Trump, we're faced with people like the Israeli right, who can be particularly scary. We're faced with racist movements. We're faced with the rise of the Front National in France. You know, a couple more big attacks in France by ISIS. And ISIS will get what, it's, what it wants, which is the Front National in power. 
So, so we're facing all of these kind of foes, and it seems to me that the one key thing with which we fight them all is democracy. And what I don't mean by that is the kind of democracy where we all kind of make big speeches and then we vote and then we go home. What I'm interested in is democratic values and democratic states and democratic constitutions and democratic ways of thinking and democratic separation of the state so that the state, the democratic state, isn't conceived of as running everything in social life. The democratic state, this is back to really old kind of classical liberal theory. The democratic state <clears throat> makes laws for the universal, but within civil society we have the right to do whatever we like. So a kind of profound notion of democracy and freedom and freedom of speech and liberty and the equality of human beings. And that means... Um, the equality of people who are considered to be of different races or different ethnicities, the equality of lesbian and gay people and women. Those values are the ones, I think, which, with which we fight the Front National in France and ISIS and Trump and the people who want to smash up the European Union and the people who threaten democratic ways of thinking. Now, the weird thing is that the kind of ultra-democratic people like Jeremy Corbyn are on the other side of that. Oof, okay. I could tell you lots of stories about Jeremy Corbyn, but it's all boring. Um, there are countless examples of where he has jumped to the defense of anti Semites, where he has embraced anti Semitic politics, where he has declared that people who are Worried about anti-Semitism are really just Zionist uh, smear mongers and all of the rest of it. This is Rad Salah, <clears throat> a man who had propagated the blood libel against Jews in Israel. And Corbyn's position was that this was a serious man and he should come to have tea in the House of Commons. Stephen Sizer is a, a he's been at it for years. He's a Church of England vicar. Um, he was finally told by his church to stop tweeting and to stop on Facebook when he published a piece that said 9-11 Israel did it. But, you know, the people who knew Stephen Sizer knew that he had been doing this for years. Jeremy Corbyn was quoted as jumping to his defence, writing a letter to the church to say that Stephen Sizer was a jolly good chap and was against Israel and for Palestinian rights. Corbyn praises Putin's propaganda channel on ISIS. Quote, they are brutal. Yes, some of what they have done is quite appalling. Likewise, what the Americans have done in Fallujah and other places is quite appalling. So a kind of, um, a sort of equaling out. These people are bad, but so are we bad. And therefore, politically, what we need is to all be nice to each other. Corbyn presented a show on press TV on the Iranian state propaganda channel. I mean, in any kind of normal political world, that would be enough, wouldn't it? To prevent you from being elected to a leader of a democratic party. <coughs> so this is what I'm talking about in terms of mainstreaming. And I've just said something about this, but I think this is rather important, and I think... Um, I'm quite heavily influenced by Hannah Arendt and her critique of totalitarianism. Again, people, I mean, I'm not exactly sure who everybody here is, but I know that you're all smart, and I know that a lot of you will be teaching in humanities departments, social science departments. We all know how to construct a critique of truth, don't we? We know how to construct a critique of law, of rights, of representation, of parliamentary democracy, of the hypocrisy of bourgeois society. We all know how to do this. Easy, ABC. And what Hannah Arendt said was that one possible result of the revolutionary critique of bourgeois society is totalitarianism. Not that those critiques were all wrong. They're not wrong. There's, you know, 
parliament, parliamentary democracies, hugely problematic and hypocritical and all the rest of it. The critique is not wrong. But one possible outcome is totalitarianism. Totalitarianism is the successful revolutionary critique of bourgeois society in the 20th century. As she called it, the really existing stateless, classless, and international society. And her theory, her picture of totalitarianism, I think is really quite, quite interesting. And the reason I think it's interesting is because nearly all of it applies to many of my colleagues. Let's have a look. Is that a really bad thing to say? Am I on telly here? Are they listening? I don't know. Let's have a look. Firstly, totalitarianism is a global movement. It's not a parochial nationalist movement. We're talking about global movements which aim to change the whole world radically. And I think we can see that jihadism, for example, fundamentalist movements are of that style. Anti-Semitism has been very important at the heart of 20th century totalitarianism. Why? Because anti-Semitism provides an ideal organising principle. If you're going to construct a global, a global movement, then you need to construct a kind of global other. And there's so much in the culture that enables you to use the Jews to construct a global other, that it really works for you. You've got the radical critique, as I've just said, of law, of rights, of democracy, of truth, of science, all of it. You've also got the idea of the new man. The idea that, <clears throat> that um, the new man is somebody for whom all private concerns are subordinated to the movement. Kind of radical engagement, such that your only concern is making the, you know, the higher stages of communism, the jihad, <clears throat> the thousand year right, whatever it might be. And the essentialization of ideology, the creation of what the idea of the one single authentic truth, which is in, in, interpreted by the infallible leader. So I think going back to the question about why totalitarian thinking is so exciting, one of the reasons is because we're quite used to it. Because that's the kind of thinking that is normal in universities in many places. Did? Yes. May, may I ask you a question? You may. Um, for the, I'm, I'm sympathetic to what you just said, and it, it's crossed my mind, but just one slight gloss, which I think you mean. You don't mean normal in the sense that people really imagine themselves to be very style totalitarians, and they're just waiting for a chance to do it. You mean that they don't want to recognize the affinity with what they're calling critique, with other terrorizing, total totalizing yes. ones. But, sorry, I'll let you come back. That's true, but that's also, I think, that was also true about the 20th century totalitarianisms themselves. That people got on board Nazism, people got on board Stalinism, and didn't think they were bad people. But that, that, I'm glad you just said it, because that, that was my question. So why don't people learn from the past? The fact that it's familiar <clears throat> is a description I, I wasn't, you know, sure. criticizing you that, but it, what do you think? I'd like to hear more. I think, I don't know, I think there's a lot of ignorance about it. I mean, I think what I said about Nazism, for example, that it's a kind of global, almost a universalizing movement, that it's exciting, that it embodies critique of bourgeois society, I think many people would find that shocking and disgraceful. Um, you know, people would say, no, Nazism is right-wing and nationalist and bad and, and murderous. And people wouldn't recognise that reading of history at all, I think. So partly it's kind of an absolute ignorance. Um, but I don't know, that's a bigger question, isn't it? Why people don't learn from their history. Um, this is Moish Postone, <clears throat> um, who positions anti-Semitism within a kind of anti-hegemonic way of thinking. Anti-Semitism anti can, can appear to be anti-hegemonic, 
This is the reason why a century ago August Babel characterised it as the socialism of fools. Given its subsequent development, it could also have been called the anti-imperialism of fools. This is a really interesting little piece, actually, because we're all really familiar with the idea of the socialism of fools, I think. My friend and colleague, Phil Spencer, he said, why do we call it the socialism of fools? Why do we... The, the, to call it the socialism of fools is to kind of admit too much. To call it the socialism of fools is to admit that anti-Semitism is still a kind of socialism. It's still a kind of revolt against bourgeois society. Why do we call it the socialism of fools? The point is, of course, it's not a socialism at all, of any sort. Unless, of course, you have a position which says that it is specific, particular socialism. But I mean, from the point of view of the left, and that's kind of Judith Butler's position about Hezbollah, that Hezbollah are the, is the socialism of fools. It's part of the global left, but it's a part of the global left with which we disagree. And of course, my position is that it's not a socialism, and it's not part of the global left. Um, he goes on, as a fetishised form of oppositional consciousness, anti-Semitism is a form of oppositional consciousness as a way so I said this right at the beginning of I'll find that actually right at the beginning of this is my submission to the Labour Party inquiry into anti-Semitism and the first thing I said is there is anti-Semitism on the left it's not a personal failing it's not just, you know, there are anti-Semites all over society and some of them are on the left. That's not what it is. In fact, I suspect that if you think about left and right-wing anti-Semitism, I suspect that right-wing anti-Semitism is pretty kind of dull. In the sense that right-wing anti-Semitism is like right-wing racism and right-wing homophobia and right-wing misogyny. It's all a kind of hatred of the other, hatred of foreigners, they're kind of looking down at people, I don't want them in my golf club. Left anti-Semitism, on the other hand, comes out of the project, and the project is making things better. The project is, I think there's something radically wrong with the world, and I want to make it radically better, and I want to find out why there's something radically wrong with the world. And the Jews have always kind of worked in that position, since Christianity, actually, since the very birth of the, the creation of Christianity as a religion, Jesus came to save our souls, Jesus was the universal for everybody, and it was all screwed up by the one people who should have known better and who didn't love Jesus. And that not only screwed it up for them, but it screwed it up for all of us. And I think there's something within left thought that is always fascinated and pulled towards this idea that we need a radical critique of the world, we need to make the world better, and we need to find out why. And to put this in a very contemporary context, in case you think I'm sounding a bit mad, you've heard people say that um, if the Israelis and the Palestinians could make peace, then there would be no conflict in the Middle East. There would be the end of the Middle East conflict. The, the fact of Israeli occupation screws things up for everybody in the Middle East and therefore everybody in the world. Bullshit. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> I think I agree with you. <laughs> but you. But you see what I mean? This, this putting of Israel and Palestine at the very centre of everything. The boycott movement. I was at um, one of our introductory lectures for our first years, it was a bit like this, a bit bigger, and some of the student union sits there and says, we've got three campaigns, we're campaigning for better funding in education, we're campaigning against fascism, and we're campaigning against the occupation. This is in London. Which occupation? <laughs> what, it, it was just completely normal and completely natural that you know, the one thing about student funding, I can understand why students are concerned with that. Fascism, I don't know really, I don't know that fascism is particularly a threat in Britain at the moment, but, but um, the occupation. So, 
the putting of the Jews at the centre of the world. So that's where I started with my submission to the Chakrabarti Inquiry. You can download it. Um, in fact, I think I sent it round to, to everybody. Anyway, since I did that, it's gone online. I should maybe give you five minutes about how to find all the stuff that we do. <laughs> um, the main answer to that is with, at the beginning, Facebook, Twitter, um, my Goldsmith website, it's all online somewhere. So that's how I began my submission to the Czech Republic Inquiry. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. What happened was that last April, a number of... Anti-Semitism kind of became... It, it was mainstreaming with the leadership of Corbyn, and it became a mainstream political topic. The right-wing bloggers and the right-wing press were sort of beavering away and finding examples of anti-Semitism. And they were very easy to find. And... Corbyn was actually sort of, um, he was again slithering a little. He's not, he's not a kind of solid guy, but he would, what he would do was to allow people to be suspended from the party. He wouldn't stand by his comrades who think that Hezbollah is for peace and justice. Yeah, he, he kind of slithered and found the, the path of least resistance. And rather smartly, the path of least resistance turned out to be the Chakrabarti Inquiry. He called an inquiry into anti semitism in the Labour Party. Um, There's a long story, but a lot of us produced actually really high quality submissions, a number of which we published. I mean, I'll just show you this document. So it begins with saying there's something specifically left wing about this kind of anti semitism, and it's political. Two. I mean, this could be an outline for, for our whole afternoon, actually. There is anti-Semitism without, without conscious hatred of Jews. Are we all with that? Mm -hmm. It seems to me quite interesting and quite important and quite controversial, actually. Because usually if you say to somebody, you say to Judith Butler, you embrace anti-Semitic ideas, she will say, you know, how dare you? <laughs> and she will go inside her own head and she will examine her own political cleanliness and she will say, <laughs> how dare you? For the people who are nodding, mm -hmm. Judith Butler of course wouldn't do that if you found somebody who was, I don't know, was um, part of a racist institution or a sexist institution. She wouldn't do that then. Yeah. She wouldn't say, oh well, if you don't hate blacks and if you don't hate women and if you don't hate gay people, then there's no problem. But when it's yourself, you have a kind of privileged access to your own motivation. So I think there's a, an analogy with institutional racism, which most people understand. Institutional racism, discursive racism, which is about ways of thinking, about kind of normalised, stereotypical ways of thinking, or about... People in Britain will remember the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, when there was a big inquiry into institutional racism in the Metropolitan Police, and the only people who couldn't understand it was the Police Federation, the kind of police trade union, who said, how dare you accuse us of racism? And thereby they missed the point of institutional racism, which was to say that in the Metropolitan Police there were practices, and there was a culture, and there was ways of thinking, and there were ways of behaving which had racist outcomes. Everybody on the left gets that, the whole anti-racist left gets that, but when you say, actually, there are ways of thinking and institutional practices and cultures on the left, which are anti-Semitic, then people get cross. And this was quite a good exercise. People can read this in talking. I mean, when I don't know. It turned out, people know that it turned out that Shami Chakrabarti um, was uh, already offered a seat in the House of Lords by Jeremy Corbyn. This is a particularly British a particularly British story which people might not really get. But she was offered a you know a peerage to be called Lady Baroness Shami Chakrabarti and was given basically a job for life sitting in Parliament. I mean I don't know if she agreed to do the job on the anti inquiry because of that, 
I don't know if it was a payoff. I don't know if simply she was with the political project all along and therefore, you know, she both did the job on the Anti-Semitic Inquiry and is happy to sit for Corbyn in the House of Lords. Whatever it is, we related to the inquiry in good faith. Because I can't see any other way of doing that really. <coughs> and of course we published our submissions. So this was an important point too, point number three, bad apples or a problem with the barrel. Again, a familiar question of anybody who knows anything about the sociology of race and racism. About the distinction between racism as a sort of individual moral failing on the one hand, or as an um, institutional or cultural or systemic failing on the other. We went everywhere. The distinction between criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism, we start from the beginning. Everybody agrees that there is a distinction between criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism. The problem is that this truism is often interpreted such that everything is judged to be criticism and nothing is judged to be anti-Semitism. Can I ask a question? Yes, you can. What was the, your reason for using... Israel as opposed to Israeli government policy? Um, in the heading there, the distinction between criticism of Israel just or... Just in general, just in the Okay, at... well... I think... I think not a huge amount hangs on it, I think. Although I'm, I'm trying to work out what, why. I think to... So, what's your critique of France? Anybody? What's your critique of France? Le Pen. Le Pen. Your critique of France is specific politicians within the French polity, which is a, a distinction. I mean, we would think it really odd if somebody had a critique of France, full stop, and if somebody created an ism, a worldview, out of being against France. And if somebody tried to boycott France on the basis that it had occupied Algeria and it was a racist state and it had the bon lieu in which the Muslims are treated very badly and France was the nation of the Dreyfusards and France does this and that and the other and we want to boycott France and people would say, well, what about Italy? What about Britain? Yes? I don't know, but maybe because of BDS is using uh, like Israel, not Israeli policies. Yeah, but strategically it is... I I mean, I am just, exactly in the same camp as David, but I think that strategically, yep. we collectively fell into a trap yep. by saying Israel as opposed to. Yep. So it's a question. I don't. I mean, I, I, I think, don't think we win the battle anyway. Yeah, but I think that that is the answer they're coming to: is that to be at, to to have a critique of a nation state is already a kind of menace. Charlie, and if I can just add, I think one of the from my perspective, and I think from, I don't want to speak for David, but um, I think when leading politicians and leading intellectuals um, take the position of the Muslim Brotherhood or support Hamas and Hezbollah, from, from that worldview, and I think we have to be very aware and, and have a deep understanding of the ideology that we're, we're confronting with, that, I, that ideology cannot accept the self-determination of the other on Islamic land. And the Jews are the only others with self-determination in that part of the world. So when Butler, so when Hezbollah and Hamas <coughs> take a position, they want to eradicate the state of Israel, um, period. They want to eradicate Israel. They want to kill Jews. And when Butler and progressive liberal <coughs> intellectuals in the West endorses this perspective, they're talking about the self they're talking about Israel, period. And I think, I don't want to take much time from, it, from David, but from a liberal human rights perspective, if Israel is an apartheid, racist, fascist state, then from a liberal human rights perspective, we're morally obligated to dismantle that entity. So, so that's, I think that's what's at stake. I think, yeah, I think my answer is that, is that the critique, so we don't have a critique of Iran. Right. It doesn't matter. I, I guess one couldn't be critical of Iran, full stop. One could be critical of how the state operates, of what it does, of this or that or the other. But if somebody had a kind of critique <coughs> of Iran, then one would think that that was actually rather menacing 
two. Right. Wouldn't one? Well, I suppose so. Except part of the problem is that we, there is a strategic battle over rhetoric. Period. Right. We know that. Right. Israel is not all Jews are not the only citizens of Israel. Correct. Most people don't know that. As sure. stupid as that sounds, the reality is most people don't. They don't know anything about Israel. Sure. They think they know something, they know nothing. Sure. Well, so the, the, that's why I say that in yeah. terms of not, you know, there, there's a strategy. Of how do you counter something if you're not succeeding? Yeah. And year after yeah, yeah. year, we're Well, the strategic so problem is to broaden the strategic problem out. I would say the strategic problem is, is this that in order to understand hostility to Israel, in order to understand anti Zionism, in order to understand the BDS movement, one has to understand it alongside anti-Semitic movements. One has to understand what's anti-Semitic about it. And actually one has to understand that the ways that those movements operate in the real world is analogous to anti-Semitic movements. Here's the problem. The problem is that if one is fighting anti-Zionism or BDS, one cannot say that. We know that the only way to understand BDS is to understand it as an anti-Semitic movement. But if you're teaching or if you're arguing, that's the last thing you want to say. So, so there's this splitting between a kind of analysis, a sort of a, you know, objective analysis that in any, any number of ways you can show that BDS is in a tradition of anti-Semitic movement. But we know that if we're involved in a, you know, a debate in the American, whatever it is, uh, Anthropological Association, we don't stand up and we say, this is an anti-Semitic movement and that's why it's wrong. We do everything to avoid it. So, so the, the kind of strategic problem is, is a kind of, it's really quite a profound problem. That what we know to be true <coughs> is what we cannot say. Which makes me actually want to skip around. I don't care, I'm skipping everywhere. Do people mind if I skip? I like to skip. Um, which will take me back to the Lewiston formulation. If I can find it, hang on a sec. Here we are. That's where I was yesterday, by the way. Oh. <laughs> Um, right. Ken Livingston, a, ser a ser apparently serious man on the left, on the British left, for many, many years. He was the anti-Thatcher voice in the Great London Council in the 80s. He was the mayor of London for two terms. Long story, he was outside a party. He got into an argument with a Jewish journalist. Um, the Jewish journalist actually had been told by his people that he would get a quote after the party. He says to Livingston, give me a quote about the party. It was the do for Chris Smith's 10th anniversary of coming out, I think. Give me a quote for the party for, about this. And Livingston says, Ugh. I think Livingston must have been drunk, but he denies it. <laughs> and he says, uh, he says, oh, go out of my way. And the journalist says, come on, I'm just doing my job here. Give me a quote. And Livingston turns on it, because of course if somebody says, oh, I'm just doing my job, what are they like? They're like a Nazi, because Livingston does have a thing about Nazis. So he says, you're just like a German war criminal. And, and the, the journalist says, no, just give me, <laughs> give me a quote about Chris Smith and his coming out party. You're just like a Nazi. Your paper's a bunch of scumbags and blah, blah, blah. And the guy said, look, I'm Jewish. I don't like being called a Nazi. Just give me a quote. So, of course, the journalist has all this on tape. So, Ken Livingston goes home, he goes to bed, he wakes up with a sore head in the morning and he says, oh no, what have I done? I've made a terrible mistake. No, he doesn't do that. <laughs> he goes to bed, he wakes up in the morning and he says, ah, I'm going to be accused of anti-Semitism. Brilliant. This is going to be good for me. And he writes a piece in The Guardian a couple of weeks later and he says, for far too long, the accusation of anti-Semitism has been used against anyone who is critical of the policies of the Israeli government, as I have been. Two things going on here. One is the idea that the accusation of anti-Semitism is manufactured as a weapon, has been used. 
The accusation of anti-Semitism has been used against anyone who is critical of the policy of the Israeli government, as I have been. Secondly, a complete mushing together of, on the one hand, criticism of the Israeli government, and on the other hand, anything else. In this case, being kind of rude persistently to a Jewish journalist, or supporting a boycott, or you know, uh, saying the swastika equals the Star of David, or whatever it is that may or may not be anti-Semitic, is all subsumed into the idea of criticism. Now, the interesting thing about this is that I came up with this about, I think about 10 years ago, and I called it the Livingston formulation, because what I noticed was that this formulation, the counter-accusation, was really, really common. So somebody accuses you of anti-Semitism, what do you do? You say, firstly, in, in the privacy of your own head, out of Judith Butler, you say, I'm clean. And then you say, there must be a reason why you're accusing me of anti-Semitism, even though I'm clean. And the reason must be something to do with you. It must be that you're trying to gain something out of it. It's a crying wolf. It's a kind of pulling the Holocaust card. It's all of these things which in racism, in the sociology of race and racism, we've understood for, you know, forever. But with anti-Semitism, it's suddenly got its new life. Mm -hmm. As I said, I named this formulation after Ken Livingston 10 years ago, and I've been quite kind of amused to see that in the last six months, he's really embraced this identity. Um, I'll show you a nice little video of Ken having a conversation with John Mann. People seeing this? I don't need to play it? No. Still racist, in the school. It's still racist. Uh, we wrote to this thing in a disgusting way. You say it's not true. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you're a lying racist. Hang on, I should explain. <laughs> Ken Livingston's been on the... So, in fact, it's a more interesting story still. One of the examples that I told you about of anti-Semitism, which became public, at the time of April, May, was a woman called Naz Shah, who was a Labour MP in um, Bradford East, who's a Muslim woman, who in fact had loads and loads of goodwill because she was the one who defeated George Galloway. And somebody dug up some stuff about Naz Shah from the past. Um, so, for example, she had, re she had shared on Facebook a map of the United States with Israel superimposed on it, saying, wouldn't it be brilliant if they all went to America? And it would, the transfer of the Israelis would only cost this much money. And a kind of set of things that were anti-Semitic in that way. You know, not kind of explicitly, boldly anti-Semitic, but kind of stupid, offensive things which were arguably anti-Semitic. Anyway, the interesting thing was that Naz Shah got up and made an apology, and she made a proper apology. And she said, I did all sorts of things during the 2014 Gaza conflict that I didn't understand, that I'm sorry about, and I want to learn. I tell you in confidence, no, I won't tell you in confidence because there's a camera on. But many people have sat with Naz Shah and talked to her about anti-Semitism and about Israel and about all sorts of interesting stuff. So Naz Shah was an interesting story, but before that, any of that happened, Ken Lewiston jumped up on the, on the telly and he said that she should never have apologised. And he said that Hitler was um, a supporter of Zionism. In 1933, Hitler was supporting Zionism. And he was relying on some old Trotskyist text by Lenny Brenner, who'd written one of these sort of histories of you know, Zionism and the age of dictators, blah, blah, blah. Stuff that you could only possibly be interested in if you were a real kind of wonk into this kind of... As I said at the beginning, the people who were on the weird, dusty corners of the British left, I knew the story because I had been there. Anyway, Livingston says Hitler was a supporter of Zionism. Now, what this goes with, of course, is to paint Zionism as being like Nazism, to paint Hitler and the Zionists as kind of similar, Hitler and Zionists as people who did business, Hitler and Zionists who wanted the same thing, which was the Jews out of Europe, and all that old story that Ken Livingston himself has been doing for years. In fact, in the late, eight, no, the early 80s, Ken Livingston had published a cartoon of Menachem Begin 
in a SS uniform standing on a pile of skulls doing a straight arm salute. Uh, Ken Livingston has been doing this Nazi stuff for, for, for a long time. Anyway, John Mann, who's a, am I allowed to call John a mensch, um, confronted him. concentration camp in his first 50 days, the race purity laws in his first 100 days, and you dare say, you dare say that Right, you get the idea, Kenison ended up locking himself in a disabled toilet in that building. <laughs> and John Mann, I'm quite sure, knew what he was doing, because, <coughs> because this brought things to a head and, and made uh, Corbyn call the Chakrabarti inquiry and all of that stuff. Let me just say a little more about the Livingston formulation. This is a journalist called Yasmin Alibi Brown who wrote the following during the Corbyn's first campaign for leadership of the Labour Party. This must have been last summer. Quote. But the headline of the piece was Fling mud if you must, but don't call Jeremy Corbyn an anti Semite. <coughs> Quote. It is an accusation that is both absurd and menacing. The right, Blairites, and hard Zionists have formed the most unholy of alliances to slay the reputation of the next likely leader of the Labour Party. <coughs> most depressing of all is the collusion between the powerful right and the Zionists. They seem determined to crush all alternatives to neoliberal economics and Western hegemony. Do you get it? The Zionists are involved in a campaign to crush Neo, sorry, to defend neoliberal economics and to, to um, crush any movement which opposes Western hegemony. Again, we were here before, weren't we, with the notion that Zionism and Jews are at the centre of the world. And this is one of the ways in which Zionism and the Jews get put in the centre of the world. There was the Stephen Salater tweets, weren't there? I can't remember. I was looking for them actually this morning, but I couldn't find them. But again, a kind of narrative which puts... Zionism at the very centre of the defence of what they call neoliberalism and the rest of it. They seem, sorry I've done that bit, as the forces of darkness turn on Corbyn. Forces of darkness? Yeah, that would be the Zionists, the Blairites and the, and the, and the right. As the forces of darkness turn on Corbyn, the leadership contest continues its descent into a passion play. A passion play, please, a passion. Who said about repeating of history? Why does she use the word passion play? Does she know? Does she understand the history of anti-Semitism in the passion play? I don't know if she knows that or if she doesn't know that. It's actually quite an interesting question because it's a question that we can ask in a lot of places. That when people draw on explicitly anti-Semitic material, do they have any idea that they're doing it? And if they don't, how, as kind of social theorists or cultural theorists, can we explain the drawing on the power of anti-Semitic tropes without even understanding what they are? I've got some more of that later for you. <coughs> but you understand the Livingston formulation in Yasmin Alibi Brown's <coughs> telling of it. Why do people accuse Jeremy of being an anti-Semite? Well, not because he works for Press TV, not because he said that about Hamas and Hezbollah, not because he jumps to the defence of the blood libel, the blood libeler, blah, 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 etc. But because they are determined to crush alternatives to neoliberal economics. Who is it in Britain who is raising the issue of anti-Semitism in, in, in relation to Jeremy Corbyn? Well, it's people like me, it's people like the Jewish Chronicle, it's people like the Jewish communal organisations. There's a huge um, consensus 
throughout the Jewish community in Britain at this time, in this summer, that Corbyn was a problem. And what Yasmin Alibi Brown says is that that consensus is the forces of darkness and the forces trying to smash, sorry, the forces, what is it? Determined to crush alternatives to Western hegemony. So she's talking about the Jewish community. Of course, there are exceptional Jews. There are always exceptional Jews. But the fact that there are exceptional Jews doesn't mean that there's not a consensus in the Jewish community. And I think that's quite important. We all know George Galloway, I think. This is what he tweeted at around the same time, the time of the calling of the inquiry and the scandals around cannabisism. The Israel lobby has just destroyed the Labour Party, at least this Labour Party. It is an amazing achievement. They'll be dancing in Dimona. Wow, Dimona. Wow. They're dancing in Dimona. So the place, which is the kind of crucible, the, the nuclear ground zero of Israeli power, is the place where they're celebrating smashing the British Labour Party. It's kind of amazing, really. This is Len McCluskey. I said we'd come back to him. He's the General Secretary of the Unite Union, the biggest union in Britain. The row over anti-Semitism within the Labour Party is no, sorry, is nothing, <laughs> is nothing more than a cynical attempt to challenge Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. Again, the raising of the issue of, of anti-Semitism in bad faith, dishonestly, for some kind of political gain. I can give you hundreds of examples of this. Michael White was a is, I think, a deputy editor of The Guardian, big, well-respected liberal journalist. Will someone point out to the idiots that latest anti-Semitism row was launched by Tory blogger Guido Fawkes and promoted by the Mail on Sunday? So again, this is not, you know, you understand the point here, I think. This is the Stop the War Coalition. Quote, Stop the War does not accept the attempt to silence criticism of Israeli oppression of the Palestinian people or smearing sorry is that right does not accept the attempt to silence criticism of Israeli oppression of Palestinian people or smearing with the charge of anti-Semitism anyone opposing the political project of Israeli expansionism so again the raising of the issue of anti-Semitism is constructed as something which puts you outside of the community of the good. Outside, in this case, of the community of those who are critical of Israeli oppression of Palestinian people, for example. This is an old one. Tell me when you want me to stop. But, but I, the Livingston formulation, I think, is so important because it's the way in which people... It, it's the way in which contemporary anti-Semitism protects itself from having to examine itself. <laughs> Tam Dale was an old uh, Labour MP. He accused Tony Blair of, this is an old one, in 2003, I think. <coughs> Tony Blair was unduly influenced by a cabal of Jewish advisers. Does he know that the word cabal comes from Kabbalistic? Does he know that? I don't know if he knows that. He probably doesn't know that. And then he gets criticised. And he says, the trouble is that anyone who dares criticise the Zionist operation is immediately labelled anti-Semitic. Again, the Zionist operation. One, I'm, I mean, I was going to have a number of rhetorical steps, but we could just say one conspiracy, can't we? The Zionist operation. Here's a nice one from Baroness Tom. Got up at her party conference, she's a Liberal Democrat, and said, the pro-Israel lobby has got its grips on the Western world, its financial grips. Now, you might think, that that is a way of doing anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. You might think that that's a way of doing anti-Semitic conspiracy theory in a world created by Mearsheimer and Walt, actually, where you don't have to say, the Jews, <laughs> the Jews have got their grips on the Western world, you say the pro-Israel lobby, and just to be sure, what kind of grips, financial grips. And then when Jenny Tong gets called on it, she says this, I am sick of being accused of anti-Semitism when what I'm doing is criticising Israel and the state of Israel. 
so we could go on forever. There's Norm Finkelstein's five word version kill Arabs, cry anti Semitism. And here's a, what's the word? Pictorial, graphical representation of the Livingston formulation. The world's mouth is shut by the Jewish Israeli guy with an accusation of anti Semitism. And the world is unable to talk about Israel's crimes against the Palestinians. This is Latouf. So Latouf, if anybody doesn't know who Latouf is, Latouf is interesting because he's a connector between anti-Semitic Israel hatred and the kind of hostility to Israel which we're more concerned, which I'm talking about really, which I'm more concerned about. <coughs> Latouf was all over Norman Finkelstein's website at one point with cartoons like this. He's all over lots of anti-Zionist material, Palestine Solidarity campaign material and the rest of it. He also won the second prize in President Ahmadinejad's Holocaust denial competition in Iran. So why is it that the anti-Semite Ahmadinejad likes the same political cartoons that Norman Finkelstein likes? Norman Finkelstein liked. What is it that connects them? Why do they both like the same joke? That was like a rhetorical question. <laughs> this is interesting because this is 1952. So, Czechoslovakia. A lot of Jews went back to Czechoslovakia after the war. I know somebody told me a story about her dad who was a fighter pilot in Wales. He was a Jewish guy, he was a big war hero, he went back to Czechoslovakia to build socialism. Rudolf Svansky himself was one of the vicious Stalinist apparatchiks, he was the, the big guy in the state, whatever he was, the general secretary of the party. And eventually he was purged by another set of apparatchiks. And under torture, he was forced to confess in the following terms. This is Slansky's forced confession. I deliberately shielded Zionism by publicly speaking out against the people who pointed to the hostile activities of Zionists and by describing these people as anti-Semites so that these people were in the end prosecuted and persecuted. I thus created an atmosphere in which people were afraid to oppose Zionism. Which reminds us, of course, that this kind of thinking on the left comes from the Soviet Union, comes from the Stalinist tradition. The splitting of the world into imperialist and anti-imperialist began as a splitting of the world into communist and imperialist. And the Soviet anti-Semitism melded, mold, melded, became a rhetoric about the racism and pro-apartheid and pro-imperialist nature of the Israeli state. Yes? Um, you, you suggested earlier that uh, ISIS and or other you know, jihadist organizations would like nothing more than to see the right come to power. Yes. In from what you've said, it looks like they'd be just as happy to see the left come to power. If, if all of this is coming from the left. Or not. I mean, are, do, do they I not like the Paris? 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 Yeah, I, 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 I can. The, the whole concept of what ISIS are trying to do is to take people out of the grey zones. And the grey zones are where you have this nuanced debate. It doesn't matter to them that where right. you go. Yeah. Whether you go to the left or the right or whatever, the ultimate winner AR Islamist like groups like ISIS because they're making things very binary. I think, I mean, I, I think also that, that I was trying to work out, I talked to Harris about this the other day actually, I was trying to work out that there is this amazing coincidence of rhetoric that you find both on the left and amongst the Islamists about this kind of radical critique of bourgeois society, this radical critique of democracy, this radical critique of imperialism, this notion that Zionism and the Jews are at the centre of everything bad. And of course one 
tradition of it is, is kind of authentically from the left, it comes from, from the left and it comes through the Stalinists and it comes through that kind of politics. The other tradition, I think, comes from, and Harris knows more about this than me too, comes from a kind of Islamist um, uh, root. But the interesting thing is that politically they found all sorts of ways to agree with each other. And I think in very practical ways this plays out in, in, in for example, it plays out in this way. Smart kids from Egypt, for example, or from the Middle East, or from smart Muslim kids from anywhere will come to Britain, possibly to America, but I think Britain is particularly bad in this way, will go to university and what will they get taught? They'll get taught that democracy is a facade which hides bourgeois power. They'll get taught that imperialism is the worst thing in the world. They'll get taught that American and British and European imperialism is particularly the worst thing in the world. And they'll get taught that Israel is at the centre of it all. And it's kind of shameful, really, that, you know, people get sent to university in the democratic states and they get sent to learn stuff and that's what they get taught. Yeah? That, that was it, just that they were learning that in their normal classes. Um, well, maybe not. I mean, you know, maybe smart kids in, in Egypt learn interest. Or in Turkey, there's a, you know, in Turkey there's a great sort of tradition of secular democratic thinking. Come to Britain and that will be kind of beaten out of you in certain places. Not anywhere in Britain and not any discipline and not any university. Yes? There's the new trend here in the West. Also, I heard um, Harris' uh, uh, lecture that this uh, terrorist, what we call the jihadist, are mental ill. This is wrong. How you see, perceive it as a sociologue? To say that all these persons are mentally ill, so-called, yeah. they are not responsible for the... To, to, not to see, to be blind, is not to see the theological, the, the, sure. the religion. I it's think, wrong, it's wrong. I think an individual person who kind of, on his own behalf, and because he's read stuff here and there, and because he's found, he's found his way to some, you know, jihadist ideas, and he goes out and kills people, kind of, for his own reasons, I think. So, you could see it happening yesterday. I kind of followed the media vaguely, because as you know, I was on top of a mountain. Um, and uh, right at the beginning, you got, there was this incident in Russell Square. Somebody was murdered, other people were stabbed. Um, it, there was an issue of mental health. And also, there's a suspicion of terrorism. And you have to kind of, tentatively, in the privacy of your own head, you have to start interpreting what news bulletins like that mean. Um, I certainly don't believe that anybody who, is, who becomes, uh, as the word goes, radicalised into totalitarian politics, I don't believe they're all mad by any means. Of the, of, of, by any means. And lots of work was done about the Nazis too, and many of the Nazis were far from mad. Um, I suspect that an individual who goes out and sort of kills lots of people just for their own reasons and, yes, and you yes. know, makes, makes um, and then says I did it for the ISIS, I suspect there's a kind of border. Is there, what would you say? Right, they, they want to meet 72 girls upstairs. Yeah. They are not crazy. We see them as crazy. You see them as the crazy. But they are not. They know what they are doing, believe me. Yes. Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't know people's names. Go on. You refer to the Soviet Union as dividing force, but you should distinct anti Zionism stand of Soviet leadership and support of state Israel, after all. Well, it was quite distinctive. You sorry, know. I didn't get that. Did you should get, because Soviet Union, <laughs> Soviet Union supported very enthusiastically the emergence of state Israel. Yes, the Soviet Union supported the state of Israel for about a year and a half. Yes. Um, which, which was what, two or three years after the doctor's plot and three years before the, um, the execution of the General Secretary of the Czechoslovakian Communist Party on the charge of bourgeois Jewish nationalism and Zionism. So, yes and no. Yes. 
I'm, I'm just wondering if we couldn't add a little bit more depth because maybe this sort of casual display of disregard for what happens at the universities. Um, first off, think of the, the so-called uh, shoe bomber. Yes. Uh, he didn't attend the university in England in, in, in that sense. He didn't come here for that purpose. He came here because the British government tolerated a certain activity within a certain mosque. The mosque in turn radicalizes him and then they call out the heart, so to speak, and then they send him off to another location. So on a higher level of sophistication, you have to admit that he is not an intellectual. Sure. So that means that the, the, the notion that there could be a cohort that's going through the educational system that could come from the ranks of the, let's call it the better funded, represents, sociologically speaking, an entirely different kind of group and person than the individual that appears to be engaged in suddenly the jihadist activity that we would define as part of the bombing. Sure. I mean, this is not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is what the intellectuals are doing and how they're thinking and how they're operating. But that means what you're saying, though, is, is not by any stretch of the imagination the real story. Because the real story has to include those that are actively engaged in the bombings and the training. Yeah, I think many of them are, and many of them are creating a kind of political and an ideological um, culture in which that can exist. So, I mean, Hannah Arendt was interesting too. Hannah Arendt talked about the fusion or the, or the alliance between the elite and the mob. That Nazism was never just a kind of mob activity. Nazism always had its own ideologues, its own elite, its own movement. So I think the kind of coming together of the small but sort of excited elite with the, um, with the mob is kind of interesting. I mean, as it happens in Britain, most of the mob, or most of the people who may or may not be mob, are not particularly interested in anti-Semitism at the moment. They're more interested in other forms of racism and other forms of anti-democratic activity. But, but if I may add another supplement sure. to that, just as an example of how I can even take my argument a step further. Uh, a number of years back it was demonstrated that the uh, students coming from Malaysia to the University of uh, uh, Illinois at uh, Champaign-Urbana had established a system whereby they were essentially uh, Islamicizing the group as it came over, radicalizing it, uh, but within the smaller milieu of a Malaysian group at the university there, and they could take relatively moderate figures, and by the time they sent them back to Malaysia, they were ready to engage in more radical political activity. Which leads me back to the same observation about higher education, that what I would consider to be, and I have to admit, I, I take a little offense to this notion that somehow or another you walk into higher education and you can all, all together with great ease waltz out some kind of a terrorist. I think, in fact, you're missing the fact that within higher education there are very specific groups and specific individuals who are using and abusing the freedoms of the institution, yeah. and they are not representative of Western education. Yeah. No, I, I take that point. Of course, it's per purposive political action by, by groups of people who have an agenda. But there's a culture in which that kind of thing operates. So, for example, how does Jeremy Corbyn come to power in the Labour Party? He comes to power because there are hundreds of thousands of people, possibly millions of people in this country, who are not bothered, who are not bothered enough to not vote for him because he's a political supporter of Hamas and Hezbollah. Right? So, what I'm interested in, as well as the specific people who are organising specific political um, groups and, and you know, jihad or whatever, what I'm also interested in is the kind of wider political and cultural um, sea in which that is allowed to swim. And I think that that does have a serious implantation in the universities. Not all universities, not every part of the universities, but the basic fundamental ideas. The idea that democracy, for example, is a sham which hides the reality of imperialist power. I think is a very, very widespread notion in our social science department. So, and, and that seems to me goes quite well with people who are then organising around that kind of politics in a slightly different way. I just want to move on to sort of underline what I was saying about the Livingston formulation, which is this, the relentless accusation of bad faith 
against anyone who raises the issue of anti-Semitism is itself a mode of anti-Semitic intimidation. If people who raise an issue are not related to in a kind of democratic way, it's a mode of intimidation. And this was what we experienced within the uni University College Union, time and time again. Being treated as acting in bad faith and being treated as part of a sort of dishonest lobby. Or a, so instead of saying, yeah, tell me what your problem is with what Jeremy Corbyn said here or what Ken Livingston said there, it is just said, well, we're not going to discuss with you rationally because you're speaking in bad faith. Here's the thing. I think one more point and then is it time for a break, shall we? We're okay because we're 10 minutes or so. Okay. I wonder if there isn't a connection. People will know about Brexit. Um, there was a big campaign for Britain to leave the European Union. And there were basically two prongs to the mainstream campaign. One was there are too many immigrants coming in. And part of that was a worry about Muslim immigrants. And part of that was a worry about immigrants from East Europe, from Romania, from Poland, from um, Hungary. So that there was a political campaign against foreigners coming in and, you know, with, with all the kind of menacing rhetoric that comes with that. And also there was a rhetoric against being ruled from overseas, against being ruled by foreigners, being ruled by people in Brussels and all the rest of it. Now I'm wondering if, so there are two points that I want to draw out, and I'm wondering also if the same isn't happening or isn't likely to happen with the Trump campaign too in America. So firstly, we've seen that anti-Semitism has been portrayed on the left as the cry of the oppressed. <clears throat> anti-Semitism is the cry of the oppressed, and the people who oppose anti-Semitism and who um, analyse anti-Semitism are seen as people who shut the mouths, who shut the voices of the oppressed. And one saw a lot of this with the Brexit campaign, that people were raising the issue of racism and saying, it's wrong to tell British people that all their problems are from Europe, are from foreigners, are from immigration. And one of the responses to that was to say, the people who are worried about foreigners are actually the oppressed. Although what people use this term, the white working class. And it seems to me that the structure of the argument was quite familiar. So I'm wondering, firstly, if anti-Semitism on the left wasn't a kind of Trojan horse for the mainstreaming of other kinds of racist ideas. I'm also wondering if um, the mode of denial... So instead of saying, you know, if people raised issues about the racism in the Brexit campaign, there were posters about sort of hordes of dark people coming to Britain and taking over, and one raised the issue and said, look, you know, th there's a racist component to this campaign. I mean, it's not necessarily all racist. Some of it might be legitimate criticism of the institutions of the European Union, just as there is legitimate criticism of Israel. But it comes packaged with a kind of racist campaign. And there was great anger to anyone who raised the issue of racism in the Brexit campaign. And the anger took the form of saying, how very dare you. How very dare you accuse all these good British white people of being racist. I wonder if there isn't going to be the same how very dare you with <coughs> Trump. Because what we had is a kind of splitting, a sort of people tried to split British society between, on the one hand, the cosmopolitan elite, who did well out of the EU, out of the European Union, and on the other hand, the so-called white working class. Of course, the idea of the white working class is really alien to... Marxist politics or to left politics, it's a kind of new concept because the working class is not white. <laughs> the working class is 
um, you know, the working class is mixed and interesting and, and all the rest of it. So to split society in that way, I think, was rather interesting. And the familiar element of it was accusing, though, the accusation against those who raised the idea of racism, that they were a cosmopolitan elite who were trying to shut the mouths of the oppressed. So we have the idea that the Palestinians, when they, to the extent that they make, that they embrace anti-Semitic politics, are really fighting oppression. And there's a kind of parallel argument that the white working class, to the extent that it embraces racism and xenophobia in Britain, or racism and xenophobia against Mexicans or against Muslims or whatever in the United States, <coughs> to the extent that it does that, that it's really articulating some kind of rebellion against globalisation. And there's an interesting kind of little nut within that, which is the, the place that the intellectuals give themselves. So the intellectuals say, in fact, let me find a slide. Ah, we're going to the Cornell next. There was a, a, no, I will find the slide because I know where it is. Here's the slide. This slide, this is Seamus Milne. Seamus Milne is currently Jeremy Corbyn's chief of communications. And this was what he said, actually he said it in debate with me. He said, Hamas and the support it attracts is only the current expression of a spirit of Palestinian national resistance to oppression and dispossession going back decades. Hamas and the support it attracts is only the current expression of a spirit of Palestinian national resistance to oppression and dispossession going back decades. Again, Milne comes from a kind of unapologetically Stalinist tradition. And Milne believes that there is a kind of mystical spirit of Palestinian resistance which is distinct from the actual forms which it takes. So if at one minute Palestinians vote for Fatah, and another minute they vote for Hamas, and another minute they embrace some other kind of politics, doesn't matter because Seamus is here to explain to you what they really mean. And what they really mean is they want a democratic Palestine and they want a democratic resistance to oppression. So this kind of way of thinking gives the intellectuals themselves rather an interesting position. There's another similar quote from a guy called John Molyneux who was one of the big ideologues of the Socialist Workers Party in Britain and he wrote this, an illiterate conservative superstitious Muslim Palestinian peasant who supports Hamas is more progressive than an educated liberal atheist Israeli who supports Zionism, even critically. In other words, what you do and what you say and what you believe is not important. What's important is your objective position. So this idea that anti-Semitism is the cry of the oppressed and needs to be interpreted by the intellectuals or the activists. And I think it, there's a similarity, but I don't know if the Americans here recognise that or if they think I'm barking up the wrong tree com completely, but I think there's an idea in America that the people who are supporting Trump are in some sense representing a kind of rebellion against globalisation or a rebellion against the status quo or something like that. And I think we certainly saw the same thing with the Brexit debate in Britain. I think we'll stop there and we're going to come back. Um, Before you stop on that, yes. I mean, I, I, I want to reflect that. I think that the people who support Trump at this point has been shifting. Are on, I don't think there's any doubt anywhere that this is a very white, predominantly Christian, doesn't mean that they go to church or they don't go to church, yep. but white, 
Christian, white Christians yes. who are racist, mm -hmm. period. There are no nuances anymore that. And people like Sheldon Adelson who think even in remotely that in any way this yeah. could be good for either Jews yeah. or for the state of Israel, let alone the Jewish nation, have their heads up the wrong home. Sure. But that's a different question. The question is the people who are saying that the that, that, that support for Trump is a rebellion against the, the Beltway, is a rebellion against the Clintons, is a rebellion against the, the dynasty of the Clintons, is a rebellion against the, the, the way things are normally done, is some kind of hegemonic um, uprising. That's the thing I'm interested in. And if, I agree with you. I mean, I, it's not my position. But neither is it my position that Palestinians who support Hamas are kind of involved in some kind of progressive rebellion against the Israelis. Um, so that's the, the, the analogy that I'm thinking of. Anyone else on anything? We have plenty more time later. David, thank you. We'll come back in about five minutes.